Okay, let's start. Hi, everyone. Um, today, we're going to talk about Gnocchi, which is our new project we started uh, around Cinemator a few months ago. Um, so I'm going to uh, first introduce you to our speakers today. Uh, first, we have Owen here. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Uh, with a software engineer at Red Hat, and he has been our dear beloved PTL for the last six months, and is going to be our next PTL again for the next six months. Uh, Dina is here too. Uh, she works at Mirantis as a software engineer too, and she's one of our more recent Cinematic contributor. She has been a core developer for the last cycle, and myself, I work. Uh, as a software engineer at Cinometer, I've been uh, the Cinometer PTL for a year uh, before I went. And I'm driving the Gnocchi initiative for six months now. I'm trying to help with integrating it into uh, Cinometer. So before we start talking about Gnocchi, I think it's a good idea to uh, take a step back on Cinometer itself, uh, how it started and what, what the motivation behind it. So when we started Cinometer uh, about two years ago, uh, a bit more than two years ago actually, uh, we had a lot of problems we wanted to solve. Uh, first use case was billing, uh, but obviously we soon discovered that what we wanted to do was metering. So we started to meter OpenStack and to meter everything in OpenStack. Uh, we didn't want to change most of OpenStack, so we started to uh, pull things, uh, receive events, notifications, and build a lot of data from this. And we decided back then not to do any kind of trade-off. That means we didn't want to, we were not really um, sure how people were going to use the, da the data. So we decided not to lose anything, not to do any kind of aggregation, not to do s anything fancy, just reach of the data, put them into a store, and that's it. Then build a query around it, providing an API for people to use this data, and to well do whatever they want with it, doing billing, monitoring, uh, analytics of any kind. Uh, the problem is that this was a lot of data, and it's it's very hard to use this amount of data when you don't try to do any kind of optimization behind. So we did probably made a few things not totally correct in Cinometer. Uh, the data model we picked back then, um, having nothing aggregated, nothing computed on the runtime, on, on write time was uh, very hard to have good performance. Uh, basically, a lot of queries are optimized in Cinometer uh, for common usage pattern. Like if you want to go to the list of resources, it's being optimized by most of the storage driver behind. But if you do some fancy queries, uh, most queries are uh, bigger n, meaning the most sample you have, uh, the longer the query will be. Uh, when you have a cloud platform with a few hundred of nodes, and you have a few thousand uh, samples per minute, uh, you end up very quickly with a few millions, millions uh, samples in your DB, and doing fancy query on that is very, very long. Um, the data structure we picked, uh, which we named sample uh, in Cinometer, is freeform. That means that it can have anything in it. Uh, it's not entirely our fault. Uh, when we started Cinometer, we relied a lot of notifications. And the notification subsystem in, um, in um, OpenStack is freeform too. So we just didn't try to fix it in, op in OpenStack itself. We just used that. And we ended up with uh, an API which has no consistency, meaning most of the data that are returned are freeform. So it's very hard to um, know in advance which kind of fields you're going to have. Some fields are part of the API. So you got a contract with Cinometer and its API. You are sure to retrieve uh, this kind of field with this name, this type. But sometimes you just don't know. So it's hard to build queries. It's hard to retrieve the data, to manage it, uh, and to build application around it. Um, uh, last thing is that 
there's a lot of um, use cases that we saw, uh, especially in billing situation, when you want to retrieve things like uh, one, when an instance has been paused and resumed, uh, when an instance has been um, um, resized, or these kind of things which are not really meters, and it's complicated to uh, to solve this kind of issue in the API currently. You don't have a magic query uh, that can help you uh, seeing that this instance has been resized or has been moved or has been paused, etc. Uh, so we decided that it was a good time to solve this problem and to start something maybe from scratch. So what what that's what we did with Nyoki. We changed our, I think, I can say the paradigm behind how we store things. The first thing we started to do in Nyoki is to track resources. Uh, like I said, in Cinemator, the only data structure we use is sample, and sample is just I measure something, like I get a measure from a CPU chill on instance, and I send everything back to Cinemator, the value for the CPU chill, and all the information I have about this instance. And I do that every time I measure anything about this instance. That's a lot of data, and this doesn't help you knowing when the uh, resource, the instance, has been created for real. Uh, you can guess that from when you see the first sample and when you see the last sample, but I'm not sure it's really the last sample or if one sample is going to arrive 10 minutes later, all these kind of things. So we are about to build um, resource list dynamically, but it's it has a huge cost and it's not very um, a good way to tracking it. So in Nyoki, we track resources from scratch. Like we have a dedicated um, part of the API for that. Uh, we have separated two things. So in Cinemator, we gained recently the support for storing events based on notifications. So this is something we didn't have two years ago. Uh, we have that for, I think, um, maybe half an hour ISO, something like that. So it's pretty recent. Uh, but we're not able to use that to say, OK, there's some kind of data, some patterns, some use cases that you're not going to solve with samples. You're going to solve with events. And in that case, in the case of Gnocchi, we're going to say we don't meter this because this is an event. Uh, like, if, if uh, an instance has been resized, it's not a metrics, it's an event, something happened, you want to retrieve that, you're going to ask Cinemator for this event. It's not something we're going to store in samples like we used to do in Cinemator. Uh, we have metrics in Yoki, obviously, so we have resource and metrics. Metrics are time series data, which means it's only timestamp value, a list of timestamp value. Uh, nothing else, nothing fancy like we have in Cinemator with a lot of information you get from the instance. When, the, when you meter the CPU chill, you got everything about this instance. No, you don't get that with Nuki. You just get the timestamp and the value of the CPU utilization. Uh, what we do is that, that we link the metrics, the list of timestamp values, to a resource. So you get a list of timestamp value, which we name the entity. Uh, I will we'll explain it to you just after. And you got this list of metrics, and you link that to the CPU usage of this instance. You link that to the network uh, usage of this, et cetera. Another thing we do uh, in Nyoki is that this time we decided to make some kind of trade-off on data. We do aggregation. Uh, we do it eagerly. Most uh, drivers are doing this on right time. Uh, we talked a year ago, uh, I think in Hong Kong, about doing aggregation in Cinemeter. It never happened for various reasons, mainly because we think we didn't have and many people to work on that. Uh, but I think we all um, noticed that having millions of samples for a year in the Cinemeter database is not going to scale very far. And most people have, uh, I mean, I don't know many people who want to have fine-grained data from a year ago. Most people are happy enough with aggregation. So we do aggregation as a first feature and Nyoki. Uh, now I'm going to let Owen talk to you about Nyoki more deeper. Cool. Thank you, Julian. Um, so I'm going to continue on this um, discussion by doing a little bit of compare and contrast. Basically, identifying some key aspects of Salometer, which might be interpreted as shortcomings, 
and explaining at a high level um, initially, and then we'll drill down into a bit more detail as to how we're intending to address those shortcomings in the case of Noki, all right? So very simple kind of um, table here, the, the before and after, shall we say. So one axis in which you can kind of um, really see the difference between the approach taken by Classic Salometer and the new approach that um, Noki is adopting, and Julianne alluded to this earlier, is this notion of how heavy the actual samples are. So a sample in salometer terminology is our basic stock and trade. It's, it's the, the basic piece of data that we store and we manage and we make available, available so that insight can be surfaced into what's going on in your cloud. And the thing about salometer, surface, or salometer samples is that they're actually quite heavyweight things, right? Now, at a high level, really all you're interested in here generally is a number, right? So say it's CPU utilization. At one moment, it's 40%. The next moment, it's 39%. The moment after that is 41%. So the key piece of data there is a number, which is a relatively lightweight datum, right? No, it's not going to take up too much space. You can store a lot of those. Now, in addition to that actual base number, we store a bunch of identifying information, such as what's the UUID, mm, that's a bigger thing, of the resource that it's associated with, what's the UUID of the tenant and the user, and so on. So already this thing has kind of grown and growing, right? But at least it's standard for each sample. Regardless of what the source of the sample is, you know, you're always going to have an associated resource an associated project ID representing the tenant, an associated user, and so on. But in addition to that, we actually store a snapshot of the resource metadata associated with, or as it, as it existed at the time in which the sample was taken. So if you think about an instance, it would include things like the instance state. Is it active? Was it suspended? Has it been resumed? That kind of thing. But it would also include things that change very, very rarely, if at all, such as the identity of the image that the instance was booted from, the user metadata that was associated with that instance. So these things are, very are either static or very infrequently changing. But the way Salometer stores them via this kind of snapshotting approach means that this effectively the same data is duplicated over and over and over. Now that actually gives us a lot of flexibility as to how this data, these data are you know, interpreted and used going forward, but it actually creates a very, very large storage footprint that has shown to be a problem in reality. Now contrast that with what Noki does, in which case it really strips it down to the bare bones. Right? It says, really all we're talking about here is a number, and that number had effect at some particular time. So that's all we're gonna store. Right? Every time we take a new measurement, we will store the actual value and the timestamp at which we took that measurement. Right? And then all of this other data that we had previously snapshotted on a per sample basis, we're going to magic that data up in a different way. Right? And we'll talk about how, how we do that later. Right? So we have certain use cases in Salometer currently that depend on these sample data being repeated over and over. And we'll see that the strategies that we have in mind for actually enabling those use cases going forward will allow us to do it with Noki in a much more lightweight way. So that's the first kind of axis of comparison. Another point that Julianne alluded to as well is that, well, how long are you really interested in keeping this data around for, right? Forever? That might be the case for some data, but for a lot of stuff like, say, CPU utilization, its currency is really key, yeah? So the data that's fresh, that's related to, say, the last hour or the last day, that's kind of actionable data. You could drive, for example, alarming off it and use your alarms to trigger auto-scaling actions. But the data from last week, uh, not so much. Last month, last year, uh, again, it's becoming much less useful. Now, that would be the case in CPU util. But you could look at some other types of data that was used to drive billing, such as the existence of a certain number of instances. And that's the type of stuff that you probably want to keep a around for a much longer amount of time. Yeah, if somebody comes and queries their bill from six months ago, you need to have the data there so that you can back it up, right? So the, one of the problems with Salometer is that <coughs> our initial stab at expiry was completely global, 
right? So basically, data exists in full resolution until it falls off the cliff, and then it no longer exists, right? And that's done in a way that's not selective on the basis of what type of data it is, right? So clearly, you want to be able to store different types of data for different amounts of time, but also, do you really want that kind of fallen off the cliff behavior? Do you want it to be like full res, full res, full res, and then nothing? Or would it be much more convenient to keep a small amount of full resolution data, then roll that up at a certain granularity, right, and store that for a longer period, and then maybe roll it up to an even more coarse grain granularity and keep that for an even longer period again? So what you get is this gradual aging out of the system of these data as opposed to a sudden expiry. And that's exactly what um, Nokia allows us to do. We can choose individual time series, set an archive policy on each individual time series selectively, and then that archive policy allows it to be gradually rolled up in ever um, coarser grain until finally we discard the data, or we keep it around forever if necessary. But if we are keeping it around for forever, the assumption would be that we're doing it in a, in a fairly coarse grain form. Okay, so let's look at another couple of axes of, of comparison here between classic accelerometer and Noki. Again, Julien uh, alluded to this idea of aggregation, when we actually do the aggregation, right? In classic accelerometer, it's all done on demand. So by on demand, I mean in order to satisfy an individual query. So if you query the accelerometer API and you say the period I'm interested in is hourly, what we will do is in the back end, we'll go and say in Mongo, we'll do a big old map reduce. And we'll take these data, we'll stick them into buckets based on the granularity you chose, and we'll say, ah, the average for that hour was whatever, the average for the next hour was some other value, and we'll do all of that. Now, if you emit exactly the same query five minutes down the road, we'll do that work again, yeah? Because it's all done on demand, yeah? Whereas what Noki does is, <coughs> as the data is being ingested, right, or soon thereafter, it eagerly does the roll-up, yeah? So you identify a number of aggregation functions like averages, minima, maxima, even more exotic things like standard deviations, right? And as the, the data are being ingested, basically the aggregation is happening continually. Now, different storage drivers do it different ways, and I'll talk about the pluggable storage driver layer um, later on. Some of them do it absolutely eagerly, as in as the data point is literally received, it's aggregated. Others do it in a slightly kind of laggy fashion. But the effect is, is, is the same. For, for queries that basically don't extend over the very recent time period, you don't repeat this work over and over because the aggregation is done on demand, or sorry, done eagerly as the data is received. Okay, so let's talk a little about some, the basic kind of lingua franca of Noki, right? So we got a certain kind of terminology we use with Salometer. We talk about things like meters and samples and so on. So to, to distinguish our kind of new way of, of imagining this, we've used different terminology, right? So first off, we have, of course, our natural concept of a resource. So this is common. We talk about resources in, in classic accelerometer. We talk about it in Noki also. A resource basically is just a thing. Now, usually, it's a thing in the cloud, right? A user-visible thing such as an instance, a volume, an image, um, a load balancing VIP, something like that. Something that a user can reason over. But sometimes also it's something in your infrastructure, like a host or even a IPMI sensor, right? It's just a thing, right? So we store some representation of these things and separate it off but linked, we store a representation of data about some aspect of those things, right? Now, those aspects we refer to as entities. So we wanted to keep the, the naming ultra, ultra, ultra generic, yeah? So what would be a typical entity? Well, it would be something like, say, if the resource was an instance, the entity could be CPU utilization, yeah? If the resource was a VIP, the entity could be the number of open connections. If the resource was a image, the entity could be the number of downloads. Yeah? So it's some aspect of that thing that you want to kind of store data uh, or gather data about. And generally, the mapping would be one to many. Yeah? So you've got one resource, and you want to look at lots of different aspects of that resource and gather data on it. Now, the entities in the Ganoki kind of realization of this are 
identified by UUID in a standard kind of OpenStack way, but we also have a way of identifying them by name for convenience. So you can say, if you know that the um, resource is X, you can find out which entities are associated with that resource. Or you can just say, associated with resource identified by this UUID, give me the entity named CPU util. Yeah, so we've got multiple different ways of identifying them. And then the last key concept is this idea of a measure. A measure is an individual data point associated with an entity, which is itself associated with a resource. And measures in Noki, and this is the kind of key idea, are ultra, ultra, ultra lightweight. They're feather light. All you're talking about here is the number, okay, the value, and the time at which the measure was taken. So effectively, it's just a couple. Uh, it's just a pair, a timestamp, and a value. And that's one um, value within a, a time series. And the fact that we store them in this kind of ultra lightweight ma way means the additional storage required for each individual measurement that's taken is very, very small. And also these values are very convenient for manipulating using libraries like, say, the Pandas uh, Analytics Library or for using specialized data stores such as OpenTSDB or Influx. They fit very, very closely with, with that model. Okay, so going a little deeper, um, some more, slightly more advanced concepts in, in, in Noki. Uh, one is this idea of an archive policy. So recall earlier I talked about this kind of falling off the cliff versus the gradual aging out of the system. And it's the archive policy that drives that notion of gradually aging out. So an archive policy basically is a set of pairs, and each pair defines a granularity, yeah, how fine-grained or coarse-grained these data are, and also a retention time span. Do you want to keep it around for a week or a year? So typically, at a high level, you could think of hourly data being kept for a month, and daily data being kept for a year, per second data being kept for a day. That kind of idea. Okay? So basically, uh, the archive policy drives two aspects of, of uh, what Noki does. Um, at what grain the values are rolled up, and how long they're kept around for, in effect. Okay. So here's just a, a, a quick kind of visual representation of the kind of aggregation approach that, that, that Noki takes. So if you look at this picture, if you look at the kind of the timeline, right, the actual far right-hand side of the slide, that's the here and now, right? That's where we're at, okay? And time is kind of progressing in that direction. So all of these bars are looking back over some historical time frame, yeah? So basically, here we have a case where an entity has an archive policy associated with it that has three different granularities, per second, per minute, and per hour. And usually, the way you set this up is the more coarse-grained the um, archive policy is, um, the longer the retention will be. Yeah? So you keep coarse-grained data around for longer, you keep fine-grained data around for a shorter period. In general, you don't have to do that, but that's a typical case. The green bar at the top is kind of our live window. That's our kind of buffer. Yeah, so as we receive data, it's going into this green window. And that extends over some period. The period is actually configurable. And we keep that, it's at least as long as the mo one period of the most coarse grain, but generally you want to have a look back window that's a bit further than that, right? Because you might receive laggy data, slightly lagging, and backfill and so on. So basically, what we do is we maintain full resolution data, and then as these data are received, they're aggregated into a number of buckets. We got a per second, per minute, and per hour in this case, but you can create archive policies a, as an administrative function with whatever retention you'll, or whatever granularity you like. And basically, depending on the storage driver, either that aggregation is done in an ultra-eager fashion, as you receive each data point, bang, it's re-aggregated, or it's slightly laggy. For example, InfluxDB, the way we've approached that, or we will approach that driver as we complete it, will be to use continuous queries, where it's kind of lagging by the, a period equal to the, the most coarse grain, in this case, um, one hour. Um, and then the actual aggregation itself is non-cascaded. That's another point that we're trying to make from this um, visual. So we don't kind of roll up our full resolution data into per second buckets and then roll up from per second into per minute, and then roll up per minute into per hour. Instead, we use non-cascading aggregation, so we don't get these distortions that you get when you take the mean of means, for example. Yeah? So full res is, is aggregated independently into each of the, the, um, the levels of granularity that you've configured. 
Okay, so at this point, I'll hand over to my colleague, Dina, and uh, she's going to talk a bit more about performance and so on. Uh, the next question I'd like to cover up is what will we do with all of these data points we've collected? Because actually after the cloud has run for a while, there are thousands and actually millions of these data points stored. So, and measuring different entities is the main concept of Nuki. But all these data points have no actual meaning and well, they're not really useful without association with entities and resources. So actually, uh, Nuki indexer is something responsible for the connection of uh, all these data points to resources, entities, and linking all this stuff together. So, and the key of uh, how Nuki should be performant and quick and, well, behave as we wish it to behave is uh, the fact that the resources are well typed. They have just defined their well, some attributes and all these things is indexed. If the resource type is unknown to the Nuki, well, okay, we can use generic type. But anyway, if we'd like to store some information, we definitely will define some kind of resource in Nuki. And uh, actually, uh, by separating the samples idea, well, measurements here in Nuki, and uh, mapping resources to these measurements, we get rid of one really interesting problem we are having now in Solometer. Because let's imagine we want to store information about CPU util for some VM, well, forever. But, and then we'd like to grab this information from Monday to Wednesday. And in this case, we need, as my colleague said, to just extract all this information stored in the database and then perform the <coughs> needed request and then just write on the aggregated result. But in Nuki, with this concept of index, uh, with concept of separated data storage for the time series data and just index that links all the things together, we get rid of this useful, useless, I mean, thing of extracting all this data from database. So when we're speaking about Nuki, of course, we're speaking about providing some kind of time series API for the different kind of storages. And uh, uh, for now, we have implemented a Swift and Pandas library-based um, driver in Nuki, and Owen and I are working on InfluxDB and OpenTSDB drivers respectively when are fighting through the reviewing process to make it work as it's supposed to. And um, actually, I'd love to cover one also really interesting question. What's about performance? Because currently, Solometer, after years of development, is not so bad, actually. And it uh, can process <coughs> not so well not so small amount of data per minute, per hour, well, whatever. And um, let's imagine we just want to write some data to the Nuki plus solometer. Uh, here is the result of just writing samples uh, collected <coughs> in 100 batches of these measurements uh, for different resources. So actually, that's kind of natural situation. We have different resources. All these metrics are not connected with each other because all, let's say, the ends are different. And uh, we are writing these information to the OpenTSDB uh, driver, actually, uh, using a dispatcher. I've just, uh, I'll just well, go through all these things like dispatchers we are writing now a little bit later. And um, OK, so that's kind of. Uh, 600 to 700 uh, measurements per second being written to the just open TSDB. But actually, that's exactly the same average number we're having now for just one collector processing uh, samples in Silometer with MongoDB or HBase backend. They just do the same number. And here is something we'd like to be close to, well, in really nearest future, because uh, this blue line is actually the result of the same test, the same database, OpenTSDB, uh, but we're writing directly for, from Solometer Dispatcher, not Nuki Dispatcher, but Solometer Dispatcher, to the OpenTSDB via just, well, quick <coughs> socket pushing all this data 
and uh, that makes about 2,000 of writes per second. And just before this presentation, we've met with Owen and Julianne, we've discussed how should we make this green line closer to blue one, and we found lots of low-hanging fruits to be fixed just well in the next days, and that will make this green chart really close to the blue one. And this result is much better than we could ever achieve with Solometer, with the current architecture of Solometer, because, uh, well, we could do nothing with this flexible but heavy structure of samples were stored at solometer. But these lightweight samples were, well, measures uh, were posted to the Nuki is something we can operate with really high speed. And, uh, okay, so let's go through current solometer infrastructure to understand how should we hack into this workflow to integrate Nuki and solometer together. So, actually, this kind of usual workflow. We have an amount of OpenStack services running in some cloud. If something interesting happens there, okay, they are pushing notifications of about the events that happen to the notification bus. Also, we are having polling agents that actually are polling these services once a minute, an hour, well, whatever you'd like to, to collect the information about metrics you'd like to collect. And all this stuff is also pushed to the notification bus, let's say to the RabbitMQ, well, or some other queue. And then all these samples, notifications pushed to the queue are processed by notification agents and they're transformed to something that can be eaten nice by collectors and then collectors are writing all this data to the database. Currently we're having separated storages for the events, matters and alarms actually and that was the first step we've done to separate these things from one huge storage driver we had. And this is the first step to integrate Solometer and Nuki because actually we are interested in metrics for the case of Nuki. And also we have an API that can perform different queries, well, in the way we just described for some of the cases. There is alarm evaluator that is, well, some uh, that is calling periodically the API, trying to understand what's going on, if some alarm has happened, well, whatever. And if happened, okay, let's call an alarm notifier and notify services interested in this alarm, for example, heat, about some, well, some threshold has been, well, some threshold was received, received well, whatever. So, and the question is, where should we hack into this infrastructure, this quite complex workflow to make Nuki uh, work inside of this scheme, not only uh, well effective, but also performance and in quite a simple way. And really, here's the answer. We are planning to uh, translate all Nuki API to the Solometer version 3 API for the all time series related requests to operate effectively with time series information we're storing in OpenTSDB or InfluxDB or well, whatever, and move all these time series database interaction to Solometer Collector uh, that is actually writing things to the database. And the steps we're doing now is integrating Nuki as a separate piece of code, a separate project for now. Its code is stored on StackForge actually, uh, inside the Solometer workflow using Solometer database dispatcher mechanism. Actually, that's something collectors using, well, just write data to the data store. So that looks like a nice place to hack into just as proof of concept of how all this thing might work. So actually, I guess that's all from my side, Owen. Thank you, Dina. Um, yeah, so I'll pick it up again and just continue with a, a couple of kind of concluding um, points to talk about. So basically, I mentioned earlier that one of the key things that we wanted to do here was to make the actual um, unit of data that we store much, much more smaller and much more lightweight. But as it happens, we've got a, a number of kind of use cases with Solometer that do depend on the more heavyweight, more highly decorated data being stored. And one of those is the alarming use case. Now, the reason why effectively we have alarming within Solometer, the, the kind of motivating use case was the requirement to drive auto-scaling in heat, 
Yeah? So Heat basically generally wants to scale out the number of instances that are hosting some particular service, like a, you know, a web server, a database, or something like that. And it's generally driven on the basis of the observed trend in, say, CPU utilization, that kind of thing. Now, we've got a group of instances there that are somehow all collected together. They're, they're associated from a heat point of view. They're all part of the same autoscaling group. But that notion doesn't actually extend outside of heat much. Right? So there's not a really a good way of identifying those instances, except for some of this metadata. Right? So basically, the way we work is when Heat spins up a new instance as part of an autoscaling group, it decorates that instance using user metadata. And that user metadata includes an identifier for this autoscaling group. And then we can query over the salometer data right, and aggregate over all of the instance data over a certain time period that matches the user metadata that was set on the instance to identify it as being a member of this autoscaling group. Yeah? So that's one case where we've actually kind of embedded in our design of another feature a assumption about how the underlying storage uh, or how the underlying data is stored. So how are we going to get around that? Well, the approach that we're um, looking at basically is to support cross-entity aggregation in Noki, right? And then to identify the set of entities, so this would be the set of, say, CPU utilization time series that we have associated with a bunch of instances all of whom are members of this autoscaling group, that we will identify those using strongly typed, fairly selectively chosen metadata or uh, attributes of those resource that we store as first class citizens in the resource representation, not as free form, unpredictable data that just sits in a dict and that dictionary may or may not contain those values. Yeah? So for example, in the case of this particular um, usage of the um, metadata, what we're doing is we're adding a strongly typed server group attribute to the resource representation. And each of the resources in Noki is going to have a relatively small number of strongly typed attributes. And then we'll be able to kind of aggregate over all of the matching entities that are associated with resources with the same attribute value using this cross-entity aggregation mechanism. Okay. So the second um, common use case in Salometer that also depends on these heavyweight samples is this notion of reconstructing the resource uh, state timeline. So taking a particular instance and looking at the span of time for which the instance was active, and then there was another span of time for which it was suspended, and then you resume that and it becomes active again. Yeah? So you can reconstruct directly from the sample data um, the actual major lifecycle events, and that gives us a clue as to how we're going to address this, in the lifetime of that resource. Now, as it happens, these events are generally quite infrequent. Yep, if you take an instance in your cloud, how often do you actually resize it? Not often. How often do you actually suspend it? I mean, it's not something that happens in, you know, on a daily basis or even a weekly basis, or you have many instances that are never resized ever in their lifetime. So it's much cheaper to actually store the events that basically represent those state um, transitions that we're interested in rather than to continually snapshot the data that's either static or very infrequently changing. Another question about Noki that's often leveled, basically, is, well, wait a minute, lads. What are you doing here? Effectively, you seem to be just reinventing the wheel in terms of time series storage. There are lots of dedicated, specialized, metrics-oriented databases out there. So why are you doing Noki? Well, the thing is, we're not really reinventing the wheel. The idea, as in much of OpenStack, is for Noki to be highly pluggable, right? to use a back-end driver model, and to support a variety of different storage drivers. Now, we have a canonical one that's based on the Pandas Analytics Library and Swift. And that's intended to be something that can be run without anything external. Right? So you can just use services that you know uh, are likely to exist in your OpenStack cloud, such as Swift, for storage. And that brings certain advantages. It also brings a lot of advantages to us in terms of testing these things in the, in, in the continuous integration gate. But going forward, we've got, under active development, as, as Dina mentioned earlier, two other storage drivers, both of which are based on specialized metrics-oriented databases, uh, one of which is OpenTSDB, and the other one is InfluxDB. Yeah? And in this case, you may well ask the question, well, what does Noki actually bring to the table? What value does it add above what Influx can already do? 
Well, what Noki manages in that case is the key entity to resource mapping, which drives the cross-entity aggregation, and it also manages an abstract notion of archive policy. So that you can define an archive policy and then have the storage driver map that on to, say, continuous queries with shard-based retention in the InfluxDB case and map it onto something different entirely in the OpenTSDB case. Uh, so Noki presents this very abstract, very standardized notion of that archive policy. Okay, so very briefly, I've almost run out of time, as per usual, but um, some forward-looking questions, things that we have under active consideration. These are the hot questions that we're trying to address this week in a lot of our design sessions. So as was mentioned previously, Noki has been developed somewhat at arm's length. It's been a StackForge project that Julien span up. Um, we've kept it kind of separated in arm's length from the Salometer core so as not to be too disruptive on our continuing uh, maintainership of the Salometer core. So obviously we're going to have to bring those two things together somehow. Yeah? We're going to have to merge the two core teams. We're going to have to bring the Noki code into the Salometer repo or to have a model where we're consuming from multiple repos. Yeah? So we have to decide how we're going to do that. We got some gnarly migration questions. Clearly there are Salometer users out there in the wild. They've built up non-trivial data stores based on the old model. So how are we going to transition or manage that migration? Are we going to have some mechanism whereby we can mine this more lightweight data from the previously built up more heavyweight data? Yeah? So there, that, that, that's a, 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 a non-trivial question that, that we've got to answer. And the other thing is that in, in OpenStack in general, we've got a fairly well-defined way of deprecating things. Right? You put something on the deprecation path, it stays on the deprecation path for a number of cycles, and then it kind of goes away. Yeah? That's how we basically go from things that are legacy features to things that are no longer supported. In the case of Salometer, because we've got such a discontinuous step here, we may want to have that deprecation path unusually long. We may want to keep the V2 API around for longer than two cycles, yeah? depending on what our, our, our users who've actually got in deployment currently um, would like us to do. So that, again, is, is, a, is an open question. OK, so um, we're kind of out of time. Um, usually, we've got this link slide as, a, as something to look at while questions are being asked. Um, I think I burned most of the potential Q&A time by going on at length about what we're going to do. So apologies for that. Uh, we may have time for maybe one or two questions if, if there's anything brief that's on anybody's mind. Shoot. Mm. That, that's a fair point. I think we're concentrating more on the, the pre-aggregation route um, because we had a case previously where we did no roll-up whatsoever. And we found that queries in general tended to apply to fairly coarse-grained time periods. And the fact that we were doing this on demand meant there was a lot of computational cost in terms of repeating very similar MapReduce jobs in Mongo and so on. Um, if you want to follow a model whereby you do that aggregation on demand, um, that's something we could potentially accommodate. I've, yeah, I've, it's not been our focus, to be honest. So you, you have correctly read it. The focus has been mainly around uh, increasing the write efficiency, decreasing the storage footprint, and using uh, uh, eager pre-aggregation to decrease or reduce the computational complexity of satisfying queries. More indexing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So one last question. Yeah. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so that upfront, upfront declaration is exactly what the archive policies are about. So you go and at an added administrative level, create different archive policies and then associate them with, other, with individual entities and that's your upfront decision making that you exactly talked about. Cool. Okay, um, it's, I think we probably have to move because there's another session starting. So if you have any other questions, we're around for the Salometer design track and you can approach us individually. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.